thanks guys. It's a real, real honor to be here. I'm such a fan of GIFT and everything that you guys do. And it's great to be able to connect with folks around the world. Um, I'm Monica Yellow. I'm joining you from Denver, Colorado in the United States. And um, I've had kind of an interesting journey in my life. I am a visual artist um, that I work closely with NASA and the science community to design art and science and engineering education programs for both youth and adults. And I've been doing this kind of work for 20 years and I go out in the country and work abroad to really try to help teachers and educators in museums and schools and libraries create the physical spaces and environments for students to innovate. So my work really is revolving around the hands-on practice of building, creating, ideating, testing, and of course, collaborating. And um, so I have a little presentation that I was going to show and share some of uh, the things I've discovered along my journey, as well as highlight and celebrate some amazing uh, youth and educators that are doing great work. So I think I can just share my screen. Let's see. Is this all working? Are we good? Okay. It's working um, beautifully. Okay, great. So my group is called Eureka's, and uh, we focus on creating STEAM and make maker based um, education experiences uh, to really foster wonder, wonder, curiosity, and invention for both youth and adults. And we're kind of a collaboratory of professional artists, scientists, engineers, and educators working to kind of reinvent educational experiences. And along the way, we've worked with groups from all walks of life. And so I've kind of distilled some of the things we've discovered into top tips for engaging in hands-on learning and invention. And we feel like all leaders should be learners and all learners should be leaders. And so hopefully some of what I share will be relevant, whether you're a kid or a teacher. So our work is really about STEAM. And luckily, that's gained a lot more attention. 20 years ago when we started, people kind of didn't know what we were talking about. But what we like to do is to fuse STEM practice with the arts and hands-on making. And for those of you that are new to STEAM, that acronym stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. And really, it's an education philosophy to empower wonder and curiosity. But we find that folks interpret STEAM very differently depending on what their community is doing. Some people like to really engage in like music and math investigations. Other folks are really interested in maker spaces and technology. For my group, we really focus on fusing both the visual arts and the humanities in the creative process. So we like to explore science and technology and engineering and math through this lens of art and culture and history and community. Um, you can see some great makers right here. We work with literally thousands of teachers and students a year. Our favorite work is actually going into classrooms to work alongside the teachers to help transform their classroom, whether they're a homeroom class or a STEM class, into these creative making spaces. And part of what I love about this paradigm it, it, is that it really allows these beautiful environments to discover together. And in fact, that's what our group's name means. Uh, we made up a word, it's called Eureka's, which is Eureka, which, Ar which Archimedes used to say, the ancient uh, Greek philosopher and mathematician with the word us. So Eureka plus us equals discovering together. And in these environments, sometimes teachers feel like they have to be experts at science and technology and engineering, or sometimes kids might say, I like art, but I'm not very good at math. And what we say is neither teachers nor students need to be an expert at anything. This, this type of innovation work is really about creating a framework where teachers 
and students can work together to think about ideas, to prototype, to build solutions and work in tandem with each other side by side. Um, as a teacher, I am always saying, if a kid asks, will this work? I'm like, I don't know, let's try it. And I think it's really powerful for young people to see that adults don't have all the answers, but are willing to coach them along in the process. And for me, I know that kids are gonna come up with far more creative ideas than I could imagine. And my job is just to help facilitate the magic that they already have. Another tip we like to share with people doing any kind of um, integrated programming is make it your own. I think the best work has multiple entry points for folks. So like if we're doing a puppetry project or these kids are doing an LED um, shadow puppet theater, they're learning about the circuits and the technology and the engineering aspects, but it's completely open-ended. So some groups like to focus on poetry. Others not might be activating a history topic. Others might be doing something that celebrates their own cultural traditions. So we really encourage people to make their practice their own to help inspire their community and make it meaningful for their community. And we do like to do a lot of things with puppets and movie making and shows to also foster that expression and presenting. And as you guys are learning at GIFT, you know, those presenting skills are really important as you try to share out your ideas and your inventions. The other thing I want to encourage everybody is to really em uh, emphasize and focus on the process. Um, so often in education, we're really looking at the end result, right? You know, what did you do on that test? How did you do here? But it's the process that is the magic part of inventing and creating. And in my work, I see all the time that professional artists, professional designers, engineers, and inventors are all sharing those similar processes. They're coming up with big questions and ideas. They're prototyping and creating. They're testing, they're evaluating, they're revising their designs. They're also collaborating a lot. NASA teams have so many folks on board to help make amazing exploration happen. So have fun during that process. We also say that your hands teach you how to be an engineer. It's great to learn about everything, but the real discovery happens in the physical making portion of whatever you're trying. Another thing I want to really emphasize is, you know, let's face it, we all love technology, right? Cool gizmos and things that light up and computers. And um, I love circuits. And I, I always say LEDs are the new glitter. So if I can add a circuit and lights to something, I'm happy but we all don't have access to that. So our group is really focused on a concept we call scratch making. And you can think of it like scratch cooking. So instead of getting parts that we can plug in, we like to make everything from the ground up using just basic craft materials, cardboard, and a lot of recycled stuff. And you can build tremendous prototypes and really, Think about your ideas and vision creative solutions using things that are just around you in your environment. And in terms of that, we also think it actually builds more creative and engineering skills. When you just plug something in, like a circuit, you don't fully understand how that's working. But if you're building a battery box from scratch and you're playing with conductive materials like paper clips and, and um, uh, we even use Christmas tree bells because they're conductive to create things. You're getting what we call engineering literacy. And we like to explore things in a way that human history evolved. You know, we start with simple machines and basic tools and then progress to more complex machines. Then we start adding things that are electronic and computer technology so that you have this full range of understanding of how things are built how things move and how things work. And of course, when we're doing this stuff and we're inventing, you guys know that failure is a key part of the process, right? 
So we like to say embrace failure. Um, I myself find that a little harder to say than do. Um, I work very closely with my husband of 23 years, who's a sculptor and engineer, but I'm the painter that's a space science expert. So sometimes when I'm engineering, I get really, really frustrated. So I try to remember failure is how we learn. And I try to keep that growth mindset. Um, in our class, and right now we're in the midst of summer camp with 40 kids a day, we literally have failure parties, both for the kids and the grownups in the room. So when somebody makes a mistake, we stop the class, we scream and yell and clap for them, failure party. We let them describe what problem they have encountered, and then we work as a group to come up with collaborative solutions. Because in invention, we want to encourage you to take risks. And so you have to be as excited about the mistakes and learning that you have as you are about these successes. And a key part of all of this is collaboration. You know, like right now we have 40 kids at summer camp. That means we're going to have 40 ideas. We're going to have 40 creative um, problem solving approaches. We're going to have 40 plus like 10 for each mistakes. We're going to have solutions. And so the way that we advance everyone is by collaborating. And I love these kind of STEAM and maker classrooms because it allows different learning styles to really rise. And kids will notice like, wow, that person has a really good understanding of circuits or that person is really good at the artistic creative part of the project. And so it gets kids working together in ways they may not normally do. Um, like for instance, sometimes working with your best friend is not the best idea. Maybe there's somebody else in the room that you can connect with to help you realize what you're doing. And if you'll notice, there's some kids here soldering. Um, yes, we solder all the time. We actually start soldering with preschoolers and we teach teachers how to solder and use tools safely with really, really young learners. And we find that if you can get used to introducing tools and physical engineering skills at younger ages, by the time these kids get into middle and high school where they're doing more advanced robotics and computer science and drones, they have really, really great understanding of the engineering design process and some serious skills that most grownups don't have. Um, we've also found that these approaches can boost social and emotional learning in such holistic, authentic, and organic ways. Um, being in these types of environments where you're inventing and growing and creating together really allows different learning styles to emerge. And it's a really beautiful environment to embrace diverse learners. So we have lots of students in our classes who might be dys dyslexic, but they happen to be tremendous three-dimensional thinkers. Um, and so we love the fact that when kids are learning hands-on, they can really show their gifts, whatever they are. And they may not be gifts that are celebrated in a traditional classroom setting. The other beautiful thing is when you're making hands-on, this is not really language dependent, right? So these are great environments to encourage our students that are learning new language and trying to acquire um, new language acquisition skills. They also, these rooms create amazing opportunities to take risks, to collaborate, to rise as leaders, and what we find is that students start to really get personally involved with their own learning experiences. You know, especially after COVID, when we go out into the universe and we're working in schools, you know, we find a lot of teachers that have been frustrated, a lot of students that are no longer really inspired by being at school. And so we try to encourage that any space, any classroom can be a maker space, both to achieve academic learning goals and really important skills in science, technology, engineering, and math, as well as having these opportunities to boost the social and emotional growth of students and teachers alike. 
We also have known for 20 years um, that making and creating builds amazing communities and can really foster equity and inclusion in any kind of classroom or setting. And not all of our works in K-12 schools, a good chunk of it happens at libraries, museums, community centers, and nonprofits, even churches. And so we find that being able to create and make together allows people beautiful ways to interact in maybe methods they haven't done before. Um, we also, because of the open-endedness of a lot of STEAM type programs, you'll find that you can really celebrate cultural diversity and make projects more relevant for certain communities. Like the grownups you see on the right are amazing leaders at the American Indian Academy of Denver. And we've been in residence there throughout the spring and have had this beautiful experience of working with uh, tribal knowledge keepers to take programs and indigenize them so that students are building the science and engineering skills that are important to the schools, but they're also celebrating really important cultural traditions. And there are 150 tribes represented. So not just cultural tra traditions, but the diversity of cultural traditions and stories that are within that community. And finally, I want to um, encourage you to, to remember, innovation, learning, inventing is not just for kids. This is really a lifelong endeavor. And so if there are ways that you can embrace and engage your broader community, we always encourage folks to find avenues to bring student innovators and learners together with grownups and people that support them. Uh, we help various organizations do STEAM festivals and maker fairs. Um, we've done a lot of maker donor parties so that grownups can make and learn what they're helping to support in their community. Um, the school on the left-hand side did this amazing program. We came in and worked uh, with teachers to explore soldering and circuits with their kindergarten class then they hosted a grandparents night and the kindergarten students taught their grandparents how to make a mini lightsaber. So when you have a five-year-old kid going, no, 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 you got to switch your battery to the positive side. Like, you know, I get teary eyed. It's just absolutely brilliant. And we also encourage teens to work with youth as buddy makers, kind of like buddy readers. So this summer in our camps, we have a group of about 12 high school and middle schoolers that are coming in to work with the first and second graders, which is super empowering for both, right? So any way you can think of engaging your broader community, including doing things like presenting at GIFT on this global forum, I think is just brilliant to unite people, um, to unite ideas and just make us all better humans. So that's really kind of the end of um, my uh, PowerPoint. I will stop sharing and I'd love to see if anybody has any questions or comments that they would like to share. Um, wow, Monica. Um. <laughs> To be honest, I kind of brought tears to my eyes, really, oh. because it's just so much in line with what I believe and what I started to do um, about probably about your time, about 20, 25 years ago. Um, and the way you bring, you brought art into it, that, that was kind of always my dream. And, and I must, like, like it, it fascinates me how you've brought art really into the scientific world how did you find they kind of embraced it because you seem to have done it really easily and naturally and uh, and, and and i and i really admire you for that how, how did you find they embraced it all what did you do to yes. get them to embrace the art side well first of all warren i loved hearing you speak um you know i work kind of at the back end where i'm helping people build the skills to make and create their vision and then you're like inspiring him to launch at a whole different level. Um, all of this was frankly pretty accidental. Um, I'm a painter and I work with um, NASA scientists. I do big contemporary paintings inspired by planets and moons. 
My husband's a sculptor and engineer. His work is inspired by botany, chemistry, mathematics. And we had a gallery here in Denver and a sculpture facility and started connecting with scientists. And our first program was in 2001 with uh, the University of Colorado. We did a big workshop on art and math. And we had exhibitions and workshops and community programs and people thought we were crazy. Like, why are you putting this all together? But honestly, it was really the scientists and mathematicians that embraced it before the community did. And I found it fascinating that many scientists and mathematicians and engineers that we were working with were also artists in their own right. They were musicians, they were painters, they were writers. And, you know, they know that early in human history, this was natural philosophy and it was all tied together. It wasn't until really the industrial revolution that people started separating. And so we started getting questions from NASA and the science community of how can we get this to children? And at the time, our kids were really little and we were dissatisfied by what we were seeing in schools. And so it's interesting that the the first people to embrace it were the technical community. It took us a while to get the art community on board, but then as the education community started seeing what we were doing, they started requesting more. And the next thing we knew, we were artists in the education world. So it all progressed very organically, very naturally. And I think what we really tried to do is respond to the questions and needs we were getting. Like, how can we foster more math and measurement skills in high school? Or how can we teach young students about mechanical engineering? And then we would design things to help boost that. Wow. So, so when you got it into, any, if anyone else has got any questions, please ask. I, I don't want to hog the space here, but. Carol, but, Carol do you have a question? Yep. Um, I do actually. So I was wondering how long the process, I mean, how long it took you to get here, like from how, from where it all started to where you are now, because it yeah. seems like it's a lot of work to put this all together. It has been a lot of work, Carol, um, and it's so lovely to chat with you. But like I said, it's evolved very organically over the last, you know, couple decades. I will tell you, I was a girl that grew up in Texas in the 1970s. And I was told I could not do science because I was a girl. I was also told that I shouldn't do art because it wasn't a valid career path. And so I tend to be fairly stubborn. And those were my two loves in life. And even though people told me I couldn't unite them, I decided I was just going to make up my own career. And of course, I didn't have all the answers when I was your age or even in my 20s and 30s. I just, I was curious and I was also bored. And so I would want to learn something new. I would want to try something new. And this just kind of organically evolved. And it also helped that my husband and I have been doing this together for almost 25 years. And so we both had the same passion. And as opportunities would arise, we were like, yeah, let's try to do that. Let's see if we can make that happen. So you don't have to have all the answers right now. And I always say, you can't predict your endpoint. So embrace that journey of discovery. And every experience you have may teach you something new or lead you into a new direction. So if you follow your passions and your interests, amazing things will emerge. Um, our journey has not been easy, I will say that, but it has been a beautiful adventure. My kids teach with me. My son, who's an industrial design student, helps prototype with me. My mother is our business manager, so we've done this as a family too, which has made it all the more beautiful. Okay, thank you. Um, just another quick question before someone else can ask. Um, I was wondering if there was any, uh, there was anywhere we could go to find out more about uh, Eureka's. 
because it seems like, yeah, it seems like something I would like to um look look more into. I, I forgot to share the last shot slide with my website, but it's eureka.org. Um, we have lots of resources on there, including a free program section. All of the programs we develop for NASA um, and some other partners are free and public domain. So you can get teaching tools and resources. You can also get um, every program we do, we do maker videos. So it's actually my hands that are making projects to help teach you how to do certain things. Um, so you can always go to the website. And then I'm on social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, all of those good things. Um, we're really super active and anybody can reach out to us at any time. Uh, a lot of what we've done over COVID is be able to pop online and train or help teachers with lessons plans or work with classrooms with our online maker station. So we're doing a lot more remote work, which has been really, really super great and has allowed us to connect with more of our international partners. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I don't know, Jake, is it in the chat, our website? You want me to put it in there? Please do, please do. Okay. I try to keep everything here so you can find it easy. And if anyone uh, wants, Monica, I can just pass out your, your information if somebody contacts us. We'll that would be great. Good. And and by the way, this whole presentation is going to be up on the, uh, up on YouTube, so you'll, you'll be uh, talking to people all over the world for many years to come. Awesome. Well, this is exciting. It's um, sometimes you can feel isolated doing your work, right? And so being able to get on forums like that, you realize there's so many folks, both uh, youth and grownups of like mind. Great. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Have a great rest of the the the, the day. Thank okay, you, Monica. <laughs> it's not even half over. <laughs> Thank you.